Welcome everyone. This is lecture 31 of the series of lectures on fluids and electrolytes. This series is based on my book manual of fluid, electrolyte, and acid-based disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common clinical problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. It's available on Amazon. The link is in the description below. Today we are starting a new chapter, chapter 5, hypomagnesemia and hypermagnesemia. Part 1 is magnesium homeostasis and absorption. Let's start with a quick introduction. Magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation. The most abundant is potassium. So potassium, then magnesium, intracellularly. It is a major factor in many cellular functions. For example, it's a cofactor in hundreds of enzymatic reaction. It is needed as a cofactor for adenosine triphosphate, which is essential for energy production. Magnesium metabolism is linked to potassium and calcium metabolism, as we shall see soon. Hypomagnesemia is associated with many chronic diseases like insulin resistance, hypertension, and osteoporosis. Now, severe hypermagnesemia is associated with significant toxicity, but it has to be severe. We can replace magnesium easily, orally, or intravenously. Disorders of magnesium metabolism are many times overlooked because normally when you order a chemistry profile, a chemistry panel, magnesium is not included. Most of the times you have to order it separately. Let's talk now about magnesium homeostasis. So magnesium, like we said, is the second most abundant intracellular cation. Now in the whole body, intracellular plus extracellular is the fourth most abundant cation. Normal magnesium concentration is 1.7 to 2.6 milligram per deciliter. Therefore, hypomagnesemia will be below 1.7 and hypermagnesemia will be above 2.6. This is milligram per deciliter. If you want to use milliequivalents per liter like we would do with the sodium and potassium, the normal concentration is 1.4 to 2.2 and if we want to use the standard international units, it's 0.7 to 1.1 millimoles per liter. Now, if we have magnesium in millimoles per liter and we want to convert to equivalent per liter, we multiply by 2. Why? Because the valence of magnesium is 2. Now, if we want to convert from millimole per liter to milligram per deciliter, we multiply by 2.4.3, which is the atomic weight of magnesium, and we divide by 10. Or otherwise, you can multiply by 2.5. Now, the intracellular magnesium concentration is high, like we said, it's 8 to 10 millimoles per liter. Free intracellular magnesium is around 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. Most of the intracellular magnesium is bound, it's not free, it's bound to ATP and other enzymes. The average intake of magnesium is about 360 milligrams, which is 50 millimoles. Again, you divide by 24. Uh, 20, 50 millimoles per day. 120 is absorbed in the intestine, mostly the small intestine, not the colon. Most of the absorption of magnesium is in the small intestine. Then 20 milligrams is excreted with intestinal secretion. So the net absorption is 120, and we return 20, so it's 100. So the net absorption of magnesium is 100. So now this 100, which is absorbed, is excreted in the urine, and the remainder of the 360, which is 260, is excreted in the stool. Let's look at the diagram. The daily intake of magnesium is about 360 milligrams. 120 is absorbed, but again, 20 goes with intestinal secretions, so we are left with 100 milligrams net uptake and 260 milligrams that will go into the stool. Okay. Now, the magnesium in the blood compartment is in a status of exchange between the magnesium in the extracellular fluids, this meaning the, the blood compartment and the space between the cells, and the bones, muscles, and other tissues. Now, as you can see on the screen, most of the magnesium in the body is actually in the bone, then the muscles, then in other tissues. Now, when the magnesium is circulating in the blood, 2,400 milligrams are filtered in the urine, 
but then 2,300 are reabsorbed. So this leaves a net daily urinary magnesium excretion of 100 milligrams. Now, this illustrates again the steady state. So the steady, steady state of any element means that the intake equals the excretion. So there we go again. 360 milligrams of magnesium is the daily intake. 100 is absorbed and subsequently is excreted in the urine. And the other 240 milligrams, the, the other 260 milligrams is excreted in the stool. So what's, what's the net is zero. So 360 goes in and then 360 goes out between stool and urine. And most of the magnesium in the body is actually not in the blood, not in the extracellular fluids. It's in the bone, muscles, and other tissues. How much magnesium in the body we have? In a 70 kilogram adult, we have about 24 grams. So like we alluded to earlier, 52 or about half of the body magnesium is in the bone, about a quarter, 27% in the muscles, and 20% in other soft tissues other than the muscles. Now in the bones, it's part of the structure of the bone. It's part of the hydroxyapatite with the calcium and the phosphorus. Therefore, hypomagnesemia, low magnesium intake are associated with osteoporosis. That makes sense. Now, the extracellular fluid magnesium is only 1% of the total body magnesium, only 1%. And in the serum, only 0.3% of the total body magnesium. Most of it is in the red blood cells. Let's look at this in a different way. 52% of the magnesium is in the bone, 27% in the muscles, and 20% in the soft tissues. Only 1% in the extracellular fluid, and in the blood, we have only 0.3% of total body magnesium, mostly in the red blood cells. And you can see now that the same applies to potassium, magnesium, calcium. Only 1% to 2% of the total is in the extracellular fluids. Okay, so mostly it's in, uh, in other tissues, uh, but not in the uh, extracellular fluids and definitely not in the serum. Now, we have to pay attention to the fact that magnesium in the bone is not immediately equilibrating with the serum magnesium. So if serum magnesium falls, it's not just going to come out of the bone. Okay, so this is different with, with calcium. Um, you, you have a better chance of, of calcium moving from the bones. But in the case of magnesium, that can take several weeks. So any loss of magnesium, say due to diuretics or diarrhea, um, will have to be compensated for by the kidneys. Okay, the kidneys will have to adapt and lower excretion. So normally the kidneys excrete 3 to 5% of the magnesium filtered, uh, okay? Like we, we just said, at the total excretion is 100 milligrams, but that can be lower 10 times, can be lower to less than 0.5% in case of severe extrarenal hypomagnesemia. Now, because the extracellular magnesium is only 1%, only 1% of the total body magnesium, serum magnesium may not reflect total body magnesium, okay? Uh, now, what about this serum magnesium anyway? About 60% is free, ionized, 10% is complex, bound to citrate, phosphate, bicarbonate, or sulfate, and 30% is albumin bound. So again, this is a diagram, 60% ionized, this is free, 30% is albumin bound, and 10% is complex. This is sort of close to calcium. With calcium, we have about half ionized. Um, about uh, 40 or so percent albumin bound and about 7% complex. So kind of same, same concept. Now in this small intestine, magnesium is absorbed paracellularly, meaning between the cells, okay, mainly in the late jejunum and the ileum. Now in the colon, the absorption is transcellular and paracellular. The transcellular absorption is via two channels, TRIP M6 and TRIP M7. So TRPM is pronounced TRIP M. And the full name for these channels is mammalian transient receptor potential melastatin non-selective cation channels. This is the last time I'm going to say the full name. We're going just to say TRIP, TRIP M6 and TRIP M7. 
Diarrhea fluid contains a lot of magnesium, 15 mL equivalents per liter, while vomiting doesn't contain much, only one mL equivalent per liter. So vomiting doesn't really lead to, uh, to uh, high hypomagnesemia unless the oral intake is poor. Um, another thing I want to mention, when the absorption, when we say the absorption is transcellular, usually this is active absorption. It, it requires energy. And when it's paracellular, usually it does not require energy. Now, in the kidneys, the proximal tubule absorbs 10 to 20 percent of magnesium via the paracellular route. How? So you get absorption of sodium and water that creates gradient, magnesium follows, so you don't need energy. In the thick ascending limb, this is where the majority of filter magnesium happens. And pay attention, this is the only cation where the majority of reabsorption happens in the tau. Okay, Most of the cases with, with the sodium, with potassium, with calcium, most of the reabsorption is going to happen in the proximal tubule, yeah, usually 60-70%. Magnesium is unique. There are actually many unique aspects to magnesium. This is one of them. The thick ascending limb absorbs the majority of filtered magnesium, 60 to 70 percent, and this is usually paracellular. Again, passive diffusion does not require energy. How does that happen? We have two tight junction proteins, claudine-16 and claudine-19. They interact, they form a channel. They form a cation selective tight junction complex that facilitate magnesium transport. And this process is dependent on trans epithelial voltage. Now, the distal collecting tubule absorbs 5 to 10 percent, and the process is transcellular. So this is an active process depending on the, uh, it depends on the membrane potential. That, now, the remainder, the 3 to 5 percent of filter magnesium goes into the urine. And magnesium absorption, most of the magnesium absor absorption happens during the night. It follows a circadian rhythm. This is a summary. In the proximal tubule, only 10 to 20 percent of filtered magnesium is reabsorbed. Okay, this is in contrast to almost everything. Loop of Henle, 60 to 70 percent. Please remember that. Don't forget it. This is unique to magnesium. In the distal, distal tubule, we have 5 to 10 percent of filtered magnesium absorption, and the remainder, the 3 to 5 percent, goes into the urine. This is what I was talking about the paracellular reabsorption of magnesium in the thick ascending limb. Okay, when we say paracellular, it means that it is passive. So how is it passive? It depends on the uptake of sodium and potassium. So we have the sodium-potassium two-chloride transporter. So it's going to move sodium and potassium and chloride in. We have the ROMK channel is going to pump potassium out. We have the sodium-potassium ATPase channel is going to pump sodium out and potassium in. We have the chloride channel. So all that is happening. Now, magnesium and calcium are going to move passively via the paracellular route in between the cells. Paracellular meaning in between the cells. So you have claudine-16. It's a protein, a tight junction protein, and claudine-19. And claudine they're going to form this complex, and magnesium and calcium are going to pass through this complex. Keep that in mind. It's, it's exactly the same for calcium. This is why I put calcium in magnesium. We're going to continue this fascinating discussion on magnesium absorption in the next lecture. See you then.